In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. We thank Allah for his many blessings, his many gifts, his goodness to the human family. I thank Allah for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad for raising up from among us a divine leader, teacher, and guide in the personage of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I give thanks each and every day to Almighty God Allah. And I thank the most honorable Elijah Muhammad for preparing one for us today. A man who is in our midst today that is a divine leader, teacher, and guide to the whole of humanity, the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet all of you, dear family, brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. How are you feeling this morning? Well, I first uh, want to thank all of you for coming back uh, this morning after a long day yesterday. And I think that our beloved teacher and minister uh, deserves uh, another warm round of applause. And we must express our appreciation And to the chairman of the commission, Minister Dr. Ali Mohammed, and all of the commissioners and presenters yesterday that did an excellent job in bringing us uh, up to date on their work. I was inspired like you with all that was shared with us uh, yesterday. And I believe that the road that was given to us that all of us who are sincere in making our word bond will travel between now and February 2004. We will see uh, a rebirth in ourselves, in our community, in our nation. And the work, of course, is in front of us to do. And that is to fulfill the mission of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yesterday, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, shared with us that Mother Tainetta Muhammad had prepared a presentation, which uh, time uh, on yesterday's program did not allow her to make that presentation. And so out of honor and respect and our interest to also hear what she has to say regarding the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the value of the lessons which contains our assignment given to us from Master Farad Muhammad. She will have a few words to share with us this morning and inshallah I will come back uh, to wrap things up and we can go about our day, Allah willing, with our loved ones and family. So with that said, Mas Mariam family, will you help me to receive my mother? She's your mother. She's one of the mothers of our great faith, Mother Tainetta Muhammad. Help me to receive her with a warm round of applause. Thank you. The greetings of peace to everyone who is in attendance today at Mas Miriam. Assalamu alaikum. And please know that I am so humbly grateful to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for taking the time in his busy, busy schedule to read over uh, a paper that I presented to him uh, for his approval, and that is the reason that I am here today. I thank Almighty God Allah for coming in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi, the finder of the lost and found members of an ancient nation of Islam, members of the ancient tribe, of Shabbats. 
We thank him for searching among us to find one to represent him in his mind, his spirit, and his lineage, to be able to represent that body of wisdom and knowledge that we call the supreme wisdom. And that one, of course, is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is now in the exalted position with his Lord as the exalted Christ. We also thank him and thank him over and over again that we were given an extension of time in order to come back to the straight path of this great teaching. And that, of course, is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Sisters, brothers, uh, at this hour, it's a little new experience for us, but I think it's good to have a morning session. Our minds are a little more bright, you know, and we're able to enjoy each other's company. I only have a few words, and I was thinking over my presentation all the time since the Honorable Minister gave me this opportunity to begin this process. And basically, generally, so that you will have a knowledge of where I'm coming from, and especially because we have visitors for the first time, and you're hearing words that you've probably never heard before. And I want to take my time in laying a base for what I hope will be another opportunity to go into more details. Everything in nature, everything that has been created, was created by a motion of movement that we call time. And the measurement of that motion or that movement bears its context to everything that has been formed since the beginning of time. So the subject I chose to introduce this subject is journey, a journey into the mind of God. Now that may seem like very difficult and complex, but when we put all of the actual facts together, we can prove that God came to us out of the beginning of that movement or motion with an exact and precise movement in time to be able to make himself known at this particular end of our journey. What is the most precious commodity that we have? That's a question. My answer to that is thought. Hmm? Can you find another precious commodity more important than thought? It is what binds us to the nature of the laws out of which we are created. But what is it to examine the thought or the thinking of God? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote, and our Savior has arrived, and I think that this is a good place to begin. On page 122 through page 123, he says that the coming of Master Farad Muhammad comes to make all things new. All right? And he said that this is like the creation of us in the beginning. The God who created us had no material to use to begin a creation. He had only himself. Therefore, out of darkness and the thoughtless and invisible, he brought out the visible vision and thought and idea. Now we come to the next part of that. He made a brain which had the power to cover the sphere of our thinking and to produce from that thought what image or vision that the brain cells could conceive. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Do we have that same potential? 
All right, so then we are related to God in the area of our ability to think and to use our thoughts to materialize our vision. Is that true? Okay. Now, these things at that time, at that time, we're talking about the beginning, when the first motion was made, this was all new. There was no plan or universe except his. This is our father, the black man, the maker. The wisdom, idea, and way of thinking of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praises are due forever, is superior to any way of believing today. Now, is this saying that Master Farad Muhammad is the originator of the universe that we're in? Or does it say that he has a superior way of believing today? Which means that his thought was so powerful in his thinking of God and going into the mind and the thinking of the first God that he broke through the veil of darkness in the beginning of space, and he now has the idea and the thought of recreating, listen carefully, an entire new universe, an entire new world. And you and I have the same potential to be able to materialize and bring into existence something altogether new. So we are the people who were given this first revelation, startling revelation of God presence in man and in woman and in you. It is hard for us to believe that God would choose such a people who had deviated so much that we are called in the scriptures the rebellious children of Israel. Not the Jewish nation that we are familiar with, but we are like a parallel to what we see or read in the scriptures about the rebellious house of Israel. So in my presentation, I want to, you to follow my mind and my thinking until your mind and your thinking will go into the mind and the thinking of God himself. Is that sound a little complicated? All right. How does he do this? He goes to the root, root of all things, as our original father did in the beginning, when he built the universe out of nothing. He is as one sitting, listen to this, out in space with no material of space to make something altogether new. He goes after the root in making this new world of people. How does he do it? He makes a new mind for us and a new way of thinking. He teaches us a different education, one that we have never had before. So we can throw out, in a way, the old textbooks <laughs> that have been trying to understand the nature of life, the biology, the science, and I don't mean that we throw it away. It is useful, okay, in the right and proper application. But first, the idea is to clear our mind of everything that has to do with this world. And in clearing the mind of everything that has to do with this world, you will then have to rely upon your own thinking, your own mind, to bring into reality what is inside of you. So he gives us an education on the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, listen now, of gods, not of prophets, but of the gods of the prophets of the past. He builds our minds according to the way gods think and not the way or the thinking of servants, which are the prophets of God. 
The prophets of the past were inspired and their inspiration was true, but it is limited when God himself takes over the rule of his kingdom. Most Christian believers put that uh, personification in Jesus or in the Christ or in the Messiah, and it is written in the scriptures that he would come. Is that true? At the end of what world? Satan's world. He would come and he would set up his new kingdom, but he would come under a disguise. He would come like a thief in the night. And that is the way that Master Farad Muhammad came in the early 1930s. He came under a disguise and he held back his identity because we would not be able to understand until he raised up one from among us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, to teach us into this profound knowledge. So we call this body of knowledge, which my son mentioned, the lessons, as the supreme wisdom. This means, as I use this analogy, it's like a wheel within a wheel of a vision that takes us back, and I use this prophet as an example, because this prophet uh, is Ezekiel. You're familiar with Ezekiel. And one of the signs that Ezekiel came with in revealing himself as the Son of Man, which is mentioned about 90 plus times in this particular chapter, Son of Man, go to the rebellious house of Israel. Son of Man, uh, I want you to prophesy against Jerusalem. I want you to prophesy against Tyre and all of those ancient cities of uh, Palestine. And this was during a period when the children of Israel were exiled and taken into bondage in Babylon. So he is one of those prophets that was risen up during that particular period of time. And I think most of you must be familiar with the vision of Ezekiel, in which he was by a particular river called the River of Chabar. And when he was at that river, the heavens opened and Ezekiel was able to see like a whirlwind coming out of the north, this dazzling, bright appearance of a sign of God that was to strengthen him in his mission during out the whole course of his teaching and warning to the rebellious house of Israel who were held captive in Babylon. Now what is very, very interesting as you read the first chapter down to the 26th verse, it describes clearly that the appearance of this wheel contained a firmament, and firmament is something that is solid or mass or material, and that this firmament was over the heads of these cherubim or these four living creatures that all had, interestingly enough, symbol of, um, of a beast or cattle, ox and the eagle, a bird and a lion, but they all had the appearance of the face of a man. And up underneath their wings, which you believe angels fly with wings, if you believe that, that is, was symbolic. But up under their wings also were the appearance of their hands. All right. Then it says that his throne was made of a terrible crystal. And I always try to figure out what was this terrible crystal. Now the crystal here and terrible crystal turns out to be sapphire, sapphire stone. And if you see the sapphire stone, it is very dark hued the majority of the sapphire, right? And it reflects light in the form of like fire, right? All right, now the metallic appearance of what we call today in the research and common uh, language of the ufologists or the UFO uh, scientists, they describe a shimmering metallic type of structure to these silver disks, right? 
all right, now I want to prove to you something, that if we see or think into nothingness, your mind and your thoughts will almost automatically pick up photographically a picture. Is that true? You hardly can think a thought without seeing light. Is that true? All right. Now, above the firmament that was over their heads, referring to the angels, was the likeness of a throne, like the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man uh, above upon it. So everywhere we look, cross-sectioning Bible, whether it's Ezekiel, Isaiah, or any of the old prophets, and even if we open the Holy Quran, we will find the evidence that God, in his true appearance, in power, and in glory, can be no other than a man that can identify with other men and other women. You cannot imagine, even when you think of an angel, do you see a spook? Tell the truth. Your idea of an angel takes on a what? A physical form. And if you think of even God, you think of a man named the Christ or the Messiah coming at the end of the world. We're looking for the appearance of a man. We cannot make the glory of God anything other than a man. What we call the spirit is contained in the mind. And it is the light that goes on in your mind to give you life to travel on your journey through your thoughts. The average thought we are taught in the Supreme Wisdom lessons travels at 24 billion miles per second. So why are we given those dimensions and those measurements. It is because we too have to go back in our thinking because we can remember everything that has ever happened in our lives. But as we grow older, what happens is the rust starts accumulating on the rusty locks, they call it, of our brain cells. So we can't think past the last minute. If someone were to say, what did you think in the last minute, you would have a very difficult time <laughs> trying to tell us what that last thought was. Okay? So as long as we can think, we can be redeemed. But if you're out of your mind, it'll be very hard <laughs> to redeem you because the majority or the most important part of the redemption of you is yourself. As a man thinketh, so is he. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go too much deeper in Ezekiel because I have a limited period of time. But the reason I bring Ezekiel's vision in is because when Master Farad Muhammad came in the likeness and appearance of a man, he pointed to the heavens. And he described to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and taught him the measurements and every detail of this craft that is called the mother's plane and the mother's ship. I'm bringing this up into the modern time in just a moment. But when he came in 1930, he also acknowledged the discovery of a planet a new planet that was discovered by the scientists in uh, March of that year. They acknowledged it, announced it, the discovery of Pluto. Planet Pluto is the ninth planet out from the sun. So if Pluto represents in the Greek mythology as the god of the underworld, that's what they call it. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad uses the word a little fool. Pluto was like a little fool. So if 
the planet Pluto is nine place out from the sun and that ends the circle of the solar system with our sun and its nine planets. And if we are able to calculate our thoughts, which we are given in the Supreme Wisdom, a travel, time travel, if I could put it that way, time travel on this way, how many seconds will it take to travel to the faraway planet Pluto? And it gives 10 seconds. How many trips can you make in 10 seconds to the faraway planet Pluto? So what was the idea of Master Farad Muhammad putting all of these kinds of measurements and calculations in the body of material that we call the Supreme Wisdom? Why is it that each new convert or each new member of the Nation of Islam must begin with the recital of 10 questions and answers called student enrollment? This means that we have been, are like initiates, entering into a new school of thought. And this new school of thought is not just coming from anybody, uh, an imam visiting us from the East, or a theologian coming from any part of the world. That's why we were secluded, and still are secluded. And most people really don't understand the aims and the purpose of our being so isolated and within this special arrangement of studies. It was to expand our mind like you read in Star Trek, right? Star Trek says that to go where no man has ever gone before, right? But unless he takes the lead in telling us where no man has gone before, we won't accept it so easily. We have to wait till he keeps probing the space and keeps finding these new objects constantly coming out of this dark womb of space before we'll say, ooh, did you, did you read what the white man said today? Did you read what this scientist discovered? And if we go back into this body of material that we are to be studying within our classes, MGT, FOI, we will find all of the modern scientific investigations right there, even to the exploding of the atom, even to quantum mechanics and quantum physics, the exploding about a part of atoms and finding the tiniest little neutrinos or quarks or whatever they design as being part and parcel of the atom itself. So how do we understand now that I reached this point of my presentation what the mind and the thought of God is? If you have a mind and you have a thought, can you align that mind and that thought to the mind and the thinking of God? The Honorable Minister Farrakhan released to us a study guide called Rising Above Emotion into the what? Thinking of God. And he explores how the brain works. And if we look at our body, the nine systems of our body, the tenth system of that body that makes everything work is where? Okay, it's right here in our mind. And the mind is the control center, like a computer. You can imagine how the computer works. It has a little brain and it has a, a matrix. And I know that most everybody saw that movie called The Matrix, right? And it was like a computer game where you go into a program that was designed not by God, but was designed by an enemy to God to trap the individual who enters into the matrix hmm? Say, which one do you want? You want to go here with the blue pill or you want to go here with the red pill, right? And so if you take the blue pill, what happens? It's an unreal reality. And you're programmed to follow that unreal uh, mind 
of the architect of the blue pill. The architect of the blue pill is Satan. And the red, when you see, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, and I'm going to stretch your minds and imagination one step further. The master pointed out to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad during his teaching of three and a half years, he pointed to the heavens again. And he pointed out two stars, a red star and a blue star. And he said that the red star represents the original, okay, design and people of a civilization that would never be destroyed. The blue star represents an unreal world or a world that is contrary to the nature of the original man and people. So if you can imagine what is taking place in our world today, we have one chaos after another chaos after another chaos. Is that right? And nobody knows what this chaos will ultimately come to. Well, it's the end of one world and a bumpy ride that we've been on for 6,000 years, and that bumpy road is about ready to go all the way down into the pit. And a new world order is rising up to take its place. I mentioned in the beginning a quote from a philosopher, Manly P. Hall, actually, and he made this statement that everything that is structured has a number, has a color, and has a pattern. A pattern in which um, all things are formed that are formed. So that means that each one of us is designed with a mathematical inclination in the way that we think. This left brain, right wing, or, or hemisphere is really only information that has come through with the study of the brain over the last 20 years. And now what they are trying to say is that what we want is the left brain and the right brain to work as coordinates. So you don't think because I'm uh, musical and I have imagination and I'm creative that you cover up this side of the brain and only the right side is working. That would be rather chaotic. And the left side is supposed to be the logical um, uh, numbers, mathematics, and all of that, right? Well, don't you know if we think with the proper thought that we can do all of that? Isn't that true? Okay? We're creative, and you have to use the whole brain in order to think through darkness into light. I'm going to read you a quote from a book, The Mind's Unknown Power. And it speaks about, of course, the enterprise speeds away into darkness, and a somber voice begins this introduction with space, the final frontier. But the final frontier has not even be ch been chartered yet. And that frontier is within you. Our mind, our brain, our thinking, and only three little pounds or three and a half pounds of gray and white matter is the weight of this brain. What a marvelous way that we have to think through and solve any problems that we need to solve. But why are we scattered? The enemy did such a good job in keeping us back from our true self that is so difficult to bring us back together whole again. So we are fragmented, we're divided, we have our youth today running absolutely on a rampage of destruction because they are separated from the loving parents and the, and the peers and the family has been just totally devastated. This is not any different than what he did with us during slavery. We were separated. Our our children sometimes were taken by one slave master. The mothers and the fathers were taken to another plantation. And so getting back together today is the hardest job that any leader, any teacher has to bring us back together in unity. 
the human brain can store more information than all the libraries in the world. And one final quote, we're talking about this universe, is that everything we know of the universe, everything we know from subatomic particles to distant galaxies, everything we feel from love for our children to fear of enemy nations is experienced and modeled in our brains. Without the brains, nothing, listen to this, not quarks, not black holes, nor love, nor hatred would exist for us. So it is all in our mind. So going back to the quotes from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in Our Savior Has Arrived, this is exactly what he said, and science is proving every day that the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad are exact and precise, and that is what the body of our supreme wisdom, when you enter, and you enter this school, you immediately throw off the old way of thinking until the new idea and the creativity will begin to rise in your mind and the shackles and the dross and the locks that are on our brain will gradually fall away and we will become the people of God and the elect of God and the new world rulers that will rule with a high civilization, freedom, justice, and equality for all. And this is why our Savior comes to us in the beginning and has been with us during this whole journey to make our minds and our thinking line up with the mind and the thinking of Almighty God. I thank you for your time, and I hope that you have taken this journey with me, and that if you have questions, if we can entertain questions, I will leave that uh, to my son. This was only a little peek into where we're going. And when you become a member of the Nation of Islam, you are committed and dedicated to learning the, the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of yourself. Thank you for being so attentive. I didn't uh, shake you up with a lot of emotional firebombs today. I wanted us to kind of relax, take it easy, and really, really begin to think. Think, because your God is in you. Your God resides in you. And this marvelous mind, this marvelous capacity of the brain stores everything from the beginning of time. And it has been known that even the baby, as he develops the brain cells, he's connected to a whole world of neural nets of, of energy that connects him that he, the baby, can remember everything since the beginning of time. So that means that when that baby comes into the world, it is up to the mothers and the fathers to prepare that mind and put it in the right environment so that the light of God will shine forth. So I thank you again for listening, and I hope that we'll meet again soon for more details on the supreme wisdom lessons of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and why it's so important for our people to come back to life again, come back to yourself, restore yourself. That is the purpose of these teachings. Thank you so very much for your attention. And if you have questions, I will let my son at the end of the lecture um, request that of you. All right? Thank you so much. And those of you who are here for the first time, could I see your hands? I'm just curious. Wow. Great. Very good. May Allah continue to enlighten us and bring us what we need to survive in this end of a world that is very quickly going out to make preparation for your new work in the world of Islam. Assalamu alaikum.